I, I guess I too have a confession. I'm not, I was not, uh, in terms of my background, an authority on the American Revolution. I uh, came at, until about five years ago, and then since then, I've, that's about all I've thought about or, or, or written about. I, uh, my, my background is on the world of the 17th century, so a century or a century and a half before the, the time uh, of this book. And I came at it from that direction. I, as in, in high school, as with Tracy, I never really engaged with this material. And uh, uh, wor working on my book, The Island at the Center of the World, which is about the Dutch founding of New York, uh, I started to become intrigued by the people in Europe who, starting in the 1620s and 1630s, uh, began looking in microscopes and telescopes and seeing things that contradicted the received wisdom that they got from the church or the monarchy and formulated a new theory of what knowledge even was. That, as Descartes said, it's based on the human mind and its good sense. That there's this thing <clears throat> called reason, which is this mysterious force, this thing that every human being has in his or her brain that connects to nature and connects to the universe so that we can, in some way, comprehend it. And after that notion was formulated, people very quickly uh, formulated a number of other notions. One, that if that's the case, then it must also be the case that every human being is equally valuable. And then people had all kinds of other related insights, such as as early as the 1640s, people began saying, well, that means that girls ought to have just as much right to education as boys. And people, especially in the Netherlands, uh, began to plot little schemes to have utopian communities uh, where it would be one person, one vote. Uh, so these principles, these ideas were building in the 1640s and 1650s and so on, but they were rough, they were nascent. And so coming at it from that side and looking at this wave of focus on the individual and therefore on individual freedom and individual rights, and seeing it as society moved into the 1700s, seeing this wave building, then seeing the leaders uh, in America who were disgruntled with England for a variety of reasons, mostly economic, um, get the idea to use this, to, to focus this wave and channel it onto their issue, their concern focus it on the idea of political freedom and the idea of crafting a new kind of society, a new kind of government that would be a republic in which, I mean, it wasn't exactly one person, one vote. It, it wasn't even one man, one vote, because you had to have property. Uh, but that was the idea. It was a step in that direction. So I was interested in this idea from the perspective of um, from, you know, that background, this notion of freedom in, in a very broad sense of freedom, and as Tracy touched on, how it applied or didn't apply to different groups, how it did not, for the most part, apply to women, certainly not to slaves. So I hit on this idea that I would write a story, uh, a history or a story uh, of the time that would weave together a number of different lives. I wanted to write something that was not just about the elite, you know, the men in the powdered wigs. But they were an important part of the story, so I wanted to include them. Uh, but I wanted people of different backgrounds. And the, and, and the idea I had was, well, what if I had all these different people start this story at birth and go all through their lives and end at death, um, and then in sort of in between the cracks of their lives, we would get this history, a kind of alternate history of the period and of the period of America's founding. So I, um, I spent about two years kind of auditioning people for roles in the book, and I didn't quite know that uh, it would work. I wasn't committed to doing it, because I had to find people, first of all, whose lives are well documented. And as it turns out, it's mostly the, the elite whose lives were well documented. Uh, I also wanted uh, the people to, I wanted there to be some overlap between them. They, th these two cross paths, or these two meet in another time. Uh, so that, because I write narrative, and narrative to me is storytelling. It's history, but it's story. And I wanted the book to read as one story, not as completely separate stories about these different people. So that was my experiment, and eventually 
I came up with six people, and it wasn't a scientific thing, and uh, as Tracy said, there's only one woman in the book, and I really wanted there to be at least two, and there isn't, and so that's one of the m several things that I regret, because there were a lot of people I kind of left on the cutting room floor, you know, because it, it, at some point you have to balance being representative uh, against what fits as, as, as one book. And, um, and, and, I, and I wove these stories together. So I thought what I would do is take you through quickly, through the six people, through, through their lives. And that's this, I'm doing it, I'm breaking them out separately, but that's not the way uh, the book falls. Uh, before I, I uh, uh, talk about them, I'll just say that at a certain point in the process, I had this idea that, that, that I, was, I was very conscious that these six lives were being mediated through one consciousness, through, through the writers, through mine. And I wanted some feedback on that. I wanted to see visually, I wanted to see them mediated through one consciousness. So my sister is an artist, her name is Gina Hersey, and she obliged me. She created portraits of all six. So what I'm gonna do is show you the portraits one at a time, and then I'll talk about them. This is the first. George Germain, and by the way, four of these six portraits are based on uh, images from life, and the other two uh, she created based on description, so I'll tell you uh, which those are. This is George Sackville, he, uh, later Lord George Germain. Um, he, you know, I guess every story needs a bad guy, and he's a beautiful bad guy, uh, so much so that I, I, he was the first one who I, I settled on. I just said, I, don't, I just have to include him in the book. He uh, was from a very aristocratic British family, the Sackvilles, um, and he grew up in extreme wealth. Uh, to give you an idea, his house in southeast England, which is called Knoll, K-N-O-L-E, and it's still there. Uh, you can tour it. Um, it was built as part of a fad among the wealthy of the time. It was called a calendar house. So there were 12 separate entrances, one for each month of the year, and there were 52 interior staircases to represent every week of the year, and there were 365 rooms. So he was, uh, he was a teenager before he could wander around the house without being afraid of getting lost. Um, so George Sackville, uh, his father was a diplomat. As a boy, he went to Ireland with him. His father was the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, and through this, he got his first taste of the administration of the British Empire. And George, young George, from a very early age, was very willful, combative, aggressive. Uh, his father was the opposite. His father was kind of meek, and, and as far as George was, was concerned, he saw the Irish kind of running circles around his father, and he got this sense of how you should run an empire. He joined uh, the army, was an officer. He rose quickly through the ranks. People began talking about him as a future prime minister, and then everything collapsed. He was in fighting a battle in the Seven Years' War against France. He was at a place called Minden in what's now Germany. And he was second in command in this vast army. And his job was to uh, oversee the cavalry. He got the order. Uh, the, the, the messenger wrote up, now you are to charge. He didn't charge. He got the second order, charge. He didn't charge. The third time he charged. But, but, and, and they won the battle, but it was... Uh, deemed that had he charged when he was first told to, the French would have been annihilated and they would have been forced to surrender the entire war. He was utterly disgraced. He was the most hated man in England. He was tried, uh, court-martialed, almost executed uh, uh, for treason, completely drummed out of all public life. But he was tenacious, and he began clawing his way back up the rungs of power. That happened in 1759. By 1772, finally, he was given the post of Under Secretary of State for the American colonies. So just when the American colonies are about to declare independence, he's put in charge of them. So he ends up running the war for England. And what's beautiful about him, because I, as a writer, I try to kind of get into the, under the skin of the people, try to figure out what motivates them. As he's running this world historic war against the American colonies, he's also doing it with this very personal motivation, this, this, this need to redeem himself. So that's, that's our bad guy. Uh, this is not based on life. There's no portrait, uh, life uh, portrait of Venture Smith. 
He, um, uh, so my sister, he was probably a, a member of the Fulani tribe, or the Fulani people in West Africa, and my sister used a, an 18th century Fulani mask, and then she clothed him with uh, New England, typical New England farm clothing. He was born Brotier Furrow in West Africa. Uh, he grew up in a, a cattle raising village in the savannah. His father was a regional prince. He, when he was 10 years old, an, another, an African army invaded the village. He watched his father be tortured and killed, and then he was taken prisoner, taken to the coast, to Anamabo in what's now Ghana. And um, he boarded a slave ship, which happened to be from Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, he lucked out in one respect. Most of the slaves that were on this ship were destined for Barbados. Uh, he, uh, th th he lucked out in the sense that the steward of the ship, a man named Robinson Mumford, liked him and wanted him for his own property. So he bought him from the captain. And he had um, officers at the time would bring some goods to trade with them on voyages. And the, good, and, and the, the term that they used for your uh, goods, your trade goods, was your venture. So he gave his venture, which was four pieces of cloth and a gallon of rum for the boy. So he named the boy Venture. So henceforth, Brotier Furrow becomes Venture. Uh, Venture uh, grows up in uh, different households and different communities in Long Island and uh, as a slave. And he has several different owners. And he eventually marries and has children. And uh, part of his story, which is uh, you know, fascinating and little known among, uh, among Americans, is the reality of slavery in New England. Um, he and, and, and what particularly intrigues me about him is he, throughout the 1760s and the 1770s, he starts um, raising money. He was working at night. He's working in the pre-dawn hours. He's fishing for eels and chopping wood in order to buy himself and his family out of slavery. And what's interesting about this and ironic is he's doing this while you have uh, uh, the Townsend duties and the, all, all these acts, all these uh, milestones in the, in, in the road of um, white Americans as they begin this clamor for freedom. And to some people, to more than a few people, if they got this freedom from England, it would apply to everyone. Venture Smith seems not to have believed that because he's working steadfastly to buy himself and his family out of slavery. He eventually does. He moves to rural Connecticut to a town called Haddam and uh, sets up, and, and, and once he's there, he discovers that uh, the, 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 the life of a freed slave is in many ways more problematic than the, than the life of a slave because nobody knows what to do with you. You're between categories. Towns all over America passed laws outlawing freed slaves from settling there. So he reckons that the only thing he can do to build, to, to, to bind himself to the community is to begin buying land. So he ends up with something like 140 acres of land, which was more than a white New England uh, well-to-do uh, 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 gentleman eventually uh, usually owned. So he, he makes himself a fixture in the community. This one everybody knows. Uh, this is George Washington. and This is a drawing based on the 1772 portrait by Charles Wilson Peale. Um, Washington is 40 years old here. I won't talk a lot about Washington because I assume you know a few things about him. Um, he was uh, uh, born into sort of minor gentry, tobacco-growing people in Tidewater, Virginia. And one of the, as, as you get into a book like this, you, get, you start to see themes. You know, you, you realize in any book project, serendipity exists. You see connections that you didn't know about in the beginning. And one of those has to do with honor cultures in the 18th century. And it turns out that the kind of honor culture that Brotier Furrow, who became Venture Smith, grew up in in West Africa, is quite similar to the honor culture of Tidewater, Virginia gentry. Uh, so um, George Washington grows up with a sense of himself and an entitlement, what he will eventually get out of life. And then he, it's foiled when, when he's about the same age that Venture's father dies, George Washington's father died. And when that happened, 
everything halted. He was not going to be sent to England after all to be educated, which is what he expected. Uh, instead, he would have to stay on a farm, and, live, and, and that was the life he had looked forward to, a Virginia farmer. But he, in his teens, he began taking matters into his own hands. He couldn't have a proper education, but he wanted, he craved, he was always very ambitious, and he craved all the trappings, everything that came with stature. So he uh, got his hands on uh, a translation of a French etiquette manual, and he painstakingly, at the age 16, copies out 111 rules of civility, as he calls them. You know, things like you know, how to walk with a, a person of quality in society, how to listen to them and nod at the right times, how to eat at the table, how if you're eating cherries, for example, you don't spit the pit onto the plate that you discreetly in your hand. So very, very small details he's trying to understand uh, how, how, to, how to be a gentleman. He learns fencing. He becomes an expert rider. Um, and this self-invention is really kind of, the, to me, the, the key to, to who he became. I won't talk more about him, but I mean, obviously he eventually rises to become the leader of the army of patriots, and he is opposed to George, Lord George Germain, who's leading the British forces. They never meet, but they are sort of very aware of each other, and they're kind of eyeing each other across the Atlantic Ocean as these armies clash. Cayette uh, Wake is his name. He wa the English knew him as Corn Planter. Uh, I thought I, you, m Americans have a naive sense that there were two sides in the conflict. In fact, there were many sides. Even to say there was a native side isn't accurate. Every tribe basically had its own side. Everybody was out trying to figure out how they were going to survive this and maybe how they would get, uh, get an advantage from it. Um, Corn Planter is fascinating to me because we all have that, this notion of sort of the noble warrior. And he was that, but he, um, he had this complexity, this uh, 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 realism. He was, he was a natural politician who was able to kind of understand other sides. And I think that partly stems from the fact that uh, his mother was a prominent leader. Uh, 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 you know, she was called a lineage matron among the Seneca. His father, improbably enough, was Dutch. His father was uh, from upstate New York, uh, from a Dutch family called Abel, and he was sort of a, a, a kind of a drunk and a no good kind of guy who, um, uh, no offense to the Dutch here, um, uh, and he became a rum trader among the Iroquois Indians. So he spent time in this village, and uh, the result was corn planter. And then he was gone, and Corn Planter grows up with this sense uh, of feeling different. He later said that other boys in the village would make fun of him because his skin color was different. And he grows up with this real kind of pain, this ache of uh, you know, missing this father figure. And at one point, he walks 300 miles to find him and confronts him, and he's very unsatisfied. He was hoping for some kind of, um, I guess you would say, healing. Uh, and several times in his life, and, and, and lastly, in, in, uh, when he's a warrior during the Revolution, he is burning down a village in upstate New York, and through the smoke, he sees this old man, and he marches up to him and says, don't you remember me? I'm, you're my father. I'm your son. So uh, he is someone who, it, it's very rare for, um, for us today to be able to see any people from the period of different backgrounds, and especially Native Americans, and see the complexity, see, you know, sort of what makes them tick. And he's someone uh, uh, who, for whom we can. He becomes uh, a leader when uh, the Iroquois meet to decide whether or not to join in this fight. He counsels against it. He's overruled. Uh, they decide to fight with the British. And so he goes with the majority, fights these vicious battles, then the British and the Iroquois lose, and then the Iroquois send him to negotiate on their behalf with this new American nation. So it's this impossible position that he's in. And uh, he meets with them many times, and eventually he meets twice with Washington during Washington's presidency. And the last meeting it's, um, is very poignant, and it, and it shows his, uh, his realism, because by then 
the whites are, you know, completely uh, taking over their lands, and they're basically being forced to sell land. And so he doesn't go to Washington and say, you know, let's, uh, we insist that we turn back the clock, and those are our lands. He, he, he knows better than that. What he says, though, is, look, I've heard that there are these things called banks. I've heard that there's something called interest. Can you help me understand this concept? Because in the past, we've sold land, and then we spent the money, and we had no, ma- no land and no money. But if we can keep it and maintain a future for ourselves, so this is what he's trying to do. You see him, to me, he's kind of a metaphor for all the Native people in this, in this conflict, who basically had no good option, and he's just trying to find something, some future for his people. Um, Abraham Yates. I am uh, one of the things that I think is um, underappreciated about the American Revolution is how much of a class struggle there was. There were the elites, the men like Washington, and there were people like Yates. He was uh, the ninth son of a blacksmith from Albany, New York. He was uh, uh, apprenticed sh- to a shoemaker. He was born and raised with kind of uh, 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 antipathy toward elites. He, 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 he was a common man and he was proud of it. He also was half Dutch. His father was English. His mother was Dutch. Albany was still a very Dutch town dating back to the Dutch colony of New Netherland uh, dur- during his uh, uh, early life. Uh, he grew up speaking Dutch. His um, account book is still, it still exists in the New York State Library and uh, it's it's in a mix of English and Dutch, depending on the client that he's, uh, that he's dealing with. Um, he wants to be involved in local politics. He, becomes, he gets on the city council. Uh, he works his way up. He's one of the first people to begin clamoring for independence against England. And then, and, and so during the war, he's on all kinds of committees. He helps to write the New York State Constitution. He's uh, corresponding with Washington during the fighting. Then after the war, after they win, he basically turns on the other American leaders because they now are the new elite. They are the new enemy to him. And this is how many people in the colonies felt. They felt that we threw off this British oppressor and now you're becoming a homegrown elite. You're, you're taking the power and, and you're telling us what to do. Uh, and it came to, the, came to a head with the struggle over the U.S. Constitution. Americans uh, today, I think, you know, with, with one exception, revere the Constitution. Uh, thank you for laughing at that. Um, uh, revere the Constitution and uh, see it as this document that binds them. Uh, at the time, a lot of people were afraid of it, and Yates was one of them. He hated the first three words of it, we the people because he knew that it was a group of elite men meeting in secret who created this document, and they come out claiming to represent all the people. He, uh, like many others, thought that power should be local and that if you give power to a federal government, then you're going to suffer a tyranny eventually. He particularly hated the way the office of the president was drawn up. He said, looking at this document, all a president has to do is cajole enough of the Senate into backing him, and then he can start stacking the Supreme Court with people of his choosing, and he can become a dictator. So Yates uh, becomes kind of, is, is a forerunner of American populism, and a forerunner really of this split that was there at the very beginning in American history, uh, the split between people who thought that this federal project was a, a good thing to do, this was how you bind a country together, and people who said, no, the, the, the more distant the power is, the more in danger we are. And we see Yates's all through American history, we see them among the Trump followers in the last election, and now we see them on the other side who are suddenly afraid of what the people in power in Washington might do. The last of them, Margaret Moncrief Coughlin. Uh, this is also not a portrait from life. We don't know, uh, we don't have an image of her from life. We have a lot of descriptions. Uh, and uh, my sister put a mask on her partly to acknowledge that we don't know what she looked like, but also because she became a real uh, fixture at masked balls in London and Paris. 
Um, the, I was talking before about freedom and, and this uh, uh, large, this great wave of freedom, and how political freedom, which is what we associate with the American Revolution, was only one part of it. Um, it would be uh, an anachronism to talk about a woman's movement in the 1770s, but there, were, there was a cutting edge of it, and it was the idea of forced marriage. People were writing plays and, and, and articles in newspapers saying a woman should not be forced to marry against her will. And this is what happened to her, which is uh, one reason that I, I chose her for this book. Right in the middle of the war, in the middle of the battle for New York City, her father, a British officer in New York, insists that she marry another British, British officer whom she despises. And she tries to get out of it, and she can't. She's forced to marry him. Uh, and she's incredibly strong-willed. Uh, eventually, she goes with him to, back to Europe. They arrive in Wales. They go to an inn together. And she's so enraged that, that her life has been changed by this man she despises that she walks out the back door of the inn in Wales, walks up into the mountains, walks for 60 miles, never sees him again for the rest of her life. Um, she um, is determined to lead an independent life, which people were beginning to suggest was possible. But it, for the most part, it was not possible for a woman at that time. So she decides that there are basically two options. You can become an actress or you can become a mistress. She tries both. Uh, she has better luck as a mistress. So she becomes a mistress to several prominent men. And then from then her, on, her life is a series of highs and lows. Because one moment she's in some ball on the arm of an aristocrat, and the next moment she's in debtor's prison. Uh, and uh, her life ultimately is, is kind of a tragedy. And it moves far from what we normally think of, if you think of the period of the American Revolution. But it has everything to do with the ideas that animated the revolution and this wider wave of freedom, which was why, to me, in a way, she kind of embodies as, as much as, if not more than any of the others, what this freedom wave and, and, and what the, the era was all about. Um, I, uh, when I was writing the book, I, uh, I, I told myself all I would do was write a, a story of, of these characters' lives. I didn't want it to be about anything, because I thought, there are zillions of books written about the American Revolution, and they all tell you what it means. So I'm not going to do that. It's not going to be about anything. Well, I, I got about 150 pages into it, and I was unhappy with it. And I sat and read for a, a month or so. And it slowly dawned on me, and you would think I would have understood this by now. It's my sixth book. A book has to be about something. Um, and once I had that blinding insight, I. Um, <laughs> I realized that it was basically there, and it was this, what I've been saying, this notion of freedom and how different it was. It wasn't just this thing that people were fighting battles over in this noble cause of founding a new form of government. It played out in different ways. It played out differently for a woman and for a slave and for, for, and for a, a, a Native American. So that's what the book is about, but uh, um, it's really about its people's lives because, uh, as uh, I think Emerson said, there, properly speaking, there's no history there's only biography, and meaning that it's through lives that history happens. And that's uh, what I try to do in this book. Thank you.